So I was thinking, it's about time we built another layout. Why does this fill me with dread? It's because you know what's coming next. <laughs> so I've got a plan though. So we've done double O gauge, mm -hmm. we've done O gauge layouts before, we've done N gauge, we've done double O nine as well. But there's a brand new scale in the market that we haven't yet built a layout with. Okay. So TT120. Nice. And I've got a space over there that needs a layout in it. Well, just to the right hand side of the layout that's still drying that we built like several weeks ago. Yeah, but don't tell them about the drying. Uh, I've got a plan as well, mm -hmm. you're pleased to know. So it's going to be 10 foot by 6 foot. Yep. Double track main line, station, goods yard, little engine shed as well. Um, we're going to have a bespoke set of brand new uh, exclusive building kits as well. Uh, and um, the, the bad news is it needs to be built in the next seven weeks to debut at the Great Electric Train Show. Seven weeks to build the baseboards, supports, track, wiring, scenery. Well, it only takes 15 Ooh. minutes to make a baseboard. But it does in your world. It's only halfway through the day, so I can have all the baseboards built by Someone's before the end of the day. busy, you know. Well, busy drinking coffee. Yeah. What can I say? Oh. Go show us what you've got. You enjoy your coffee then. Mm. I'll be back in a bit. Mm. But it's day one of our new TT120 scale layout build and I'm in the workshop with a pile of timber, all the pieces I need to make the six baseboards for this new 10 foot by six foot layout. Now, um, rather foolishly, I promised in the office that I could make a baseboard in 15 minutes. So I've been set to the challenge. Um, I'm gonna set the stopwatch in a minute, but first, before we do that, I'm just gonna give you a quick run through some of the components we've got here and what's gonna make up those boards. So firstly, there are six sheets of nine millimeter thick plywood. They're all pre-cut from the timber suppliers at four foot by two foot or 1200 millimeters by 610 millimeters. Uh, so they're ready to go, they're all the same size, which is great, makes life nice and easy. Uh, I've then got a pile of 18 millimeter by 70 millimeter planed timber. That's gonna make the framework that goes underneath those baseboards. That'll make them nice and sturdy and strong like my previous baseboard designs. I've then got a pile of 44 mm square timber as well. I'm gonna use that to make a set of legs to go underneath each board as well. So there won't be two legs per board. There'll be two legs on selected boards to give them the strength. And then the other ones will piggyback off the back of that with one leg on each board after that. Completing my pile of materials here, we've got uh, important things like wood screws. So I've got two different lengths. I've got 30 mm ones for fixing the baseboard tops to the frames. And I've got 40 mm wood screws for joining the uh, timbers here to the square timbers to make up the legs as well so they're nice and strong and sturdy as well. Finally I've got some nice 60mm coach bolts which are going to bolt the baseboards together together with wing nuts and suitable large washers as well. They're all M8 size and finally I've got a tint of grey paint and uh, well, I've always felt that once I've built a baseboard give it a coat of paint just helps to make it feel finished it soaks up any moisture in the wood as well gets it set to be a long-standing baseboard for the model railway. Right, without further ado, I've got my tools out, I'm going to set my stopwatch and see how quick I can make a baseboard. So there we go, that's the first baseboard fully built and assembled and ready to move on to the next stage will be when it all gets painted. I'll do the painting at the end of the process when all the baseboards are ready to paint together. So I'll admit it took me a few minutes longer than I originally planned. I made a mistake with one of the cross members which meant I had to recut one of those. Uh, just so it took me about 20 minutes to put this whole baseboard together. Uh, and uh, well, it's now fully assembled. Um, everything's ready to go. So this is very much a tried and tested method for these baseboards. I use the same methods I've used for pretty much every baseboard I've built for Hornby Magazine over the years. Um, it's basically, it's a frame of 18 millimeter by 70 millimeter planed softwood timber, which gives me the four cross members across the middle to create a rigid support across the width of the baseboard. And there's two long beams, one each side of the baseboard, which give it strength as well. I've chosen nine millimeter plywood for the top. Now it works, it does the job. It's a nice solid baseboard without being too heavy as well. Remember I've got to transport these around as well uh, to get them to shows and things. So nice and solid, does the job, really simple process. 
Uh, in terms of tools, you'll see I've used quite a few power tools in terms of building this baseboard today. Now, if you are just building a handful of baseboards, things like the powered table saw that I've used for cutting all the timbers probably isn't quite what you want to go for. But there are options you could use, for example, a mitre block and a hand saw to cut your timbers square as well. Uh, so there's plenty of options when it comes to tools. Essentials, though, are you're definitely going to need a pencil. You will definitely need a tri-square. You'll definitely need a tape measure. And you'll also need a screwdriver, preferably electric, um, to actually get all the screws fitted into one of these baseboards as well. Right, one baseboard down. I've got five more to build though. So um, last time I was building baseboards, I was freezing cold outside. This time it's really, really hot and I'm melting. Anyway, job's got to get done. We've got a deadline to get this ready for the Great Electric Train Show. But the good news is, all the baseboards are built, everything's been test assembled here as well. But the bad news is, I've now got to take it all apart again, so we can get it all transported back to the proper workshop at our HQ, so we can start the process of painting, and then, importantly, laying tracks so we can run some trains as well. So everything's now bolted together with M8 bolts and wing nuts to hold everything together nicely in place. You see we've got the nice drop down board on this side, which is gonna give us the viaduct scene as well, which is gonna be really important to this layout as well, giving the game away of where it's going with this. Uh, over this side, we'll have a station, then we'll have uh, some good sidings around here, possibly an engine shed over there. Like I say, then round to the embankment, then onto the viaduct, tunnel scene at the other end. There's an awful lot to go into this layout, but I think it's gonna look brilliant when it's all done as well. So. Like I say, the hard work of building the baseboards is done. Now to take it all apart again and get it stacked in the vehicle, ready to go back to the workshop at HQ, and we can keep moving. It all came apart that easy, it'd be great. So it might not look much right now, but we're back in the workshop, ready to assemble the TT120 layout here. So without further ado, it's time to get the baseboards, put it all together, and we can start building the layout. There you have it. The baseboards are all now back together in the workshop where the whole layout is now going to be built. Um, next job, painting, get all these sealed and painted. Then we can move on to track laying and making this layout a working model railway. So Mike, I know we left you to your own devices to a on degree. A really hot day as well. No one get, <laughs> even came and brought me a drink. Clearly, you have skills. <laughs> You have a certain skill set. Certain skill set. And look at that. Yeah, important skill uh, set. We've got yes, baseboards. Absolutely. So talk us through what you've created here because and, and how you go about building your baseboards because you kind of almost hold the world record for building baseboards. <laughs> That's probably a bit of a stretch, but yeah, I'd have a go. And so so uh, it's all about formula for me. Um, pretty much every baseboard I've built uh, in recent years and probably in the last 10 years have been around the same basic format. Uh, certainly in terms of the solid top baseboards, it's quick, it's efficient, they're robust, they last a long time. It's everything I need from a baseboard. Um, so it's um, nine millimeter plywood for the baseboard top. And then underneath that baseboard top, there's a 18 millimeter by 70 millimeter uh, planed softwood frame. Uh, and that then is cut into, well, there's two lengths, one either side running the full length of the baseboard. Then there's four beams running across the baseboard. They're called cross beams. Uh, there's then holes through each one of those to join them to the next board. And then everything's screwed down onto that to hold it all together. You can glue it as well with PVA glue. So each time you add one of the, the, the um, 
plain sections to the timber top you could add a bead of PVA glue to it as well and that'll give you an even stronger sturdier board. And just for a bit of fun on average how long does it take you to build one of these? <laughs> Once I got my eye in I done my practice um, it takes about 15 minutes to do one of these. Wow. Um, I made a, a small error with my first one so it took me 22 minutes. <laughs> top tips for building baseboards? Um, top tips for building baseboards by the right tools. Okay. You're going to need a pencil, you're going to need a tape measure, you're going to need a tri-square, you're going to need a decent saw, whether that be a hand saw or whether it's a power saw like I've used to, to actually cut the, the timber lengths. Um, and the other thing I'd also recommend as well is go to a DIY store that will cut the baseboard tops to size for you. Save so much time, so much effort. You know, each one of these boards was, was, came from an 8x4 sheet of 9mm plywood, but it cut the timber shop into 4 foot by 2 foot panels. So all the hard work of handling those really big sheets of timber, which is never fun in a home environment, is all done for me by the time I get back to the workshop. And the old adage that you've regularly put into the magazine, measure twice, cut once. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah, measure twice, cut once. And the other thing is, I suppose, it's repeat process as well. I know that every single one of my baseboards I've ever made, with the exception of one on the diesel depot because I had to move it, these cross beams are all 16 inches in from the end of the frames. And I know they're that distance because I measured them, but also it means I can always get my drill in. So yes. when I've got to put holes through the cross braces to take wires through, there's always enough space to get the drill inside between the frames. Um, I find if you go down to 12 inches, it's sometimes not quite enough space when you've got larger drill bits in. So it's about those repeatable processes and following the same steps with every single one. So uniformity is key, especially, I guess, when you're considering where you're going to place your points, for example, if you've got point motors underneath. Yeah, that's right. You've got to know where your cross beams are when you're placing points, particularly, like I say, you want to put point motors under. There's no point in putting a point type across where these screws are because it's going to be right where there's a timber underneath. I then won't be able to get a point motor in and starts making life very difficult for myself. So, yeah, it does help. Then again, like I say, with the um, diesel depot baseboard, I came to the point where actually because of the location of the inspection pits, I had to move one of my cross members because actually it was too much in the way. So you can still be fluid with it if you need yeah. to be, but yeah. it's a case of, you know, yeah. you stick to your main uniform plan and then adapt it if you need yeah. to. It's like if, if worst case scenario, yeah. and I really, really wanted a point tie bar to sit here, I can take out the seven screws that hold that cross member in, drop it out and move it across by two inches either way. It'll then clear the tie bar and sort the problem out. Now, in addition to the baseboards, you've also created um, a series of legs yes. as well for that. How have you gone about that? Oh, right, so again, these are meant to be really simple, easy legs to use. They're the same design that I use for the uh, narrow gauge layout, fairly synod down. So they're basically they're, they're two lengths of 44 millimeter by 44 millimeter plain timber, uh, which slot into um, slots which are made with offcuts of the same material uh, into the base of the baseboard. Um, and then there's cross beams on each one of those to keep them square as well. Um, this first, first baseboard that you're leaning on here, that's got two legs to it. Okay. Then everything after that's got one leg. Right. So this one's piggybacked off that one, this one's piggybacked off that one, so forth and so forth. The only amendment to that is this one, that actually has three legs at the moment. Right. <laughs> It'll probably have four in the end. But. And I was about to come on to this one because as you can see behind us, it's at a different level and we've also got this area going on here which we've left unpainted for the video for this occasion. Talk us through this because this is the dropped baseboard method. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's lots of different methods out there for how you could do a drop baseboard to actually change the height of the layout board. Now, one option would be to make it all this height and put the entire track bed on a raised plinth all the way around. Um, because I've got so much flat top area with this and because I'm going to have raised scenery above the rest of it, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to have the drop baseboards where I needed them. Um, so in this case, what I've done is I've used um, beams across the ends and I've put little droppers down. So like supporting pieces, which then bolt, or well, screw rather, rather than bolt, onto my standard frame, the same as this frame, um, with the same type of top on it, but with the corners cut out to slot round the timbers. Now measurements are key for something like that, aren't they? Yes. So I decided what height I wanted it. Um, so I, I decided what measurement was, I set the height, I think it was six inches I went from the top of the baseboard to the top, well, sorry, from the top of this baseboard, sorry, to the top of this baseboard. Um, and then all measurements were made from that point. Um, and then by setting my measurements at the beginning of it, that end is the same as that end, which makes it all sit together nicely. Okay, so we'll come back to this part shortly. Let's first of all talk about what the grand plan is for the layout, because we've got the bare baseboards and we've got not too long between filming moments today and it appearing at the Great Electric Train Show, no. which is about six weeks away yeah, from where we are the currently. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the current plan right now, as we stand here today, 
is that by the end of tomorrow, and we're halfway through today, yeah. that we'll have the platforms built and the entire track laid for the whole circuit. Well, awesome. that's the plan. Yeah. So as long as we don't get dragged out to too many meetings, we'll be right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if we can envisage how this is going to appear, the station's going to be where? Right, so the station could be roughly where you are at the moment. Okay. Um, I've got a little bit of fluidity over that at the moment because it's the first time I've worked in TT. I'm still mm. learning how the curvature works and how things sit. So at the moment, my platforms might be too far that way. They might be in exactly the right place where I've got them spec'd out in my mind. They might need to just move this way six inches. We'll find out. But basically, there's going to be a station here, two platform faces, three tracks through the middle. So there'll be um, a, an inner loop and a passing loop on the out, outer circuit and a single track on the inner circuit. Um, there's then going to be a good shed around about here, a uh, nice little good yard, do a little bit of shunting, perfect view, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. I think about I like your layout builds. Yeah. There'll be a crossover over here so you can switch between the inside mm -hmm. and the outside tracks. Uh, there's going to be another point up here as well, and I'm actually going to put a little loco depot up in this corner as nice. well. Nice, yeah. So just a little bit of extra to the layout as well. Probably not something that would really be in this kind of setting, no. um, but it also suits what we need from this layout, but it's back in the workshop as well. Okay. Um, it's then going to sweep around the corner here. Um, as part of the goods yard, there's going to be two long sidings all the way around here as well. So you'll be able to store a couple of trains on the inner circuit as well when you want to bring different trains out to run on the layout. And then it's going to continue then, it'll become a, a two-track main line, which is going to run around all the way around behind us, and then it'll disappear into a nice big tunnel over there before it comes back around to the station again. Wonderful. That's the plan. And this is going to be a viaduct scene? Yes. Not just any viaduct. No. <laughs> no Talk us through this. So we've, we've, we started doing this with the diesel depot series uh, when we introduced the diesel depot building kits. Uh, so with the TT layout, we're introducing a whole new series of four new building kits uh, to the key publishing shop, to the key model world shop rather. Uh, and um, what we're doing is we're making all those that are going to be ready for the layout for its debut, yep. but they're going to be released each month across October, November, December, January. Uh, we're going to start with the viaduct kit. That'll be the first kit to be available. And I absolutely love this viaduct kit. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. I think you'll see it very soon in this series. Um, we then got um, platform kits coming as well, which is based on our unique cut for this layout as well. Yep. Uh, then I've got tunnel mouths, and we've got a fourth kit in design as well. Lots of exciting things to absolutely, come. Absolutely, yeah. So definitely, I'm really looking forward to all these things. The, the things like the viaduct we've been working on for a long time. And the other exciting thing as well is if you're watching this thinking, oh, I wish they were in double O gauge. Good news, all going to be in double O gauge as well. So these, every single kit we make from this layout yep. will be available both for TT120 scale and double O gauge as well. Like I say, all online to either order or pre-order at the Key Model World shop. That's keymodelworld.com forward slash shop. Fantastic. So I know earlier we were very much tongue-in-cheek sort of uh, setting the challenge of building the baseboards. Um, What's my to, next challenge? I was going to say, do you want to set your, your own challenge as to how, how long it's going to take you to complete this? Um, well, I've got five weeks. Yeah? Yeah. Is it going to still be the point where it's the, the paint is still dripping at the Great Electric Trench, or, or, or would it be yeah. dry by then? When have we not delivered a layout with the paint still wet at the show? Well, that is true. <laughs> there, there have been tacky parts. Yeah, tacky parts, yeah. Just yeah. don't touch this bit, yeah. 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 But, uh, this, this will be as complete as I can physically get it in five weeks. Um, I would suspect, in fact, I actually suspect, I know for sure there will be more detail to add to it beyond that five week process. Um, with the best will in the world, I'm quite quick at doing these things, but I'm not that quick at doing all the details. So, um, unless you've got some spare time, you know. Well, indeed, absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, watch this space is the ultimate word. Yeah, absolutely. Right, well, there is a new challenge now. I've got Getting out from underneath. Well, there is that. Well, <laughs> that's the other thing I should probably mention with this as well, actually. I've gone a little bit higher with the baseboards than You normal. have, absolutely. I was just looking in comparison, and you can't necessarily see this on camera, but in comparison to our double O gauge GCR layout, which is just behind the camera view at the moment, there is a, a distinct difference in height. Yes, yeah, so I've gone, uh, normally my standard layout height is one meter off the ground. Mm. And I, I just felt that actually 1.1 meters, it's an extra 100 mil, just made a bit of a difference to it to make it feel a, a bit more comfortable to work on. And the other thing I wanted to do as well, I wanted to raise the TT up a little bit mm -hmm. to, to put the viewer a bit more into the layout as well. Because I think with it being that, you know, 100 mil lower, it might feel that you're kind of you're having to stoop down to the end, you know, perhaps get the sense of what the value of the scale is. Yeah, it, um, it brings, the, it brings the, the, the rolling stock and the locomotives just that little bit closer yeah, to right. the eye, doesn't yeah. it? And also on this side, it makes a really nice drop scene as well. Yes. Yeah, we're going to have really nice scenery on this side where all the land's falling away from the railway, lovely viaduct through here as well. It's going to look magical. I can imagine there's going to be some lovely Hopefully. vistas, actually. Hopefully, yeah. yes, no Hopefully pressure. Well. <laughs> well, you can imagine it. I think we're starting to imagine it ourselves, yeah. so yeah. Right. Good luck with the build. Yeah, so yeah, my next challenge is then 
Let's build some platforms. Build some platforms. Yeah. Get those in place. Yeah. We'll go and have a quick cup of tea. Well, and, um, you leave me to it again. We'll see you shortly. Well, yeah. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> so, well, I know where I'm going to be for the rest of the day. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Weathering can vastly improve all aspects of any model railway in any scale and gauge, transforming a toy train into a lifelike depiction of the real thing. In this series, we explore the basic and highly effective techniques and demonstrate how to weather goods and passenger rolling stock, steam and diesel locomotives, utilizing easy to use items such as weathering powders, sprays and washes. Join Mike and Jonathan as they guide you through all the techniques needed to have a go yourself in our brand new four-part series, 1960s Style Weathering, exclusive to KeyModelWorld.com. So Mark's left me to it with a collection of pieces of timber in front of me and these are all going to turn into the new platforms for the TT layout. Now the platform kit uses a combination of laser cut MDF for the base and plywood for the tops and the sides. We're going to be offering these as actual kits that you can buy from the Key Model World shop which will deliver a straight platform just over a meter long for platform one and a platform just under a meter long for platform two in TT 120 scale. They're simple to put together, they've been designed with the beginner in mind and essentially what you've got is a collection of components which make up the frame underneath it. So you build them from the bottom up and you've got cross beams to create the platform supports which drop into the slots in the platform. You've got pieces to tie sections of platform base together as well. And where you've got the wider sections for where the station buildings go, you've only got a pit on one end of each of the supports for it. Again, they just slimpy slot into place. Now obviously here I've just dropped all these into place loose so they're not actually glued in place right now. But what we're going to do in a moment is join all those firmly in place and to do that I'm going to use Rocket Rapid Super Glue which is a really strong adhesive. Quick to work with, gets everything set quickly so we can move on to the next stage. So all we're going to do to start this process off is I'm going to take the pieces out we just temporarily put in place and add a small amount of glue to all the mating surfaces. You'll notice I'm not putting it on the actual um, locating tabs there because I don't want the glue to go through the base because I don't want to stick the base to the timber baseboard. It's as simple as that. Bit of glue along the bottom. Slot the piece in place and you're ready to move on to the next one. Now these next two pieces I'll need to take my time over and make sure I actually hold them in place because what we want to do is make sure that this join remains entirely flat and level once we join it all together. Same again, rocket rapid glue on the bottom, again avoiding the actual tabs, then press it into place in the holes in the platform base. I'm actually going to have to stand here and hold this for a few seconds to make sure it does set fully because we need to make sure it stays flat and level like I said. Bear with me. So now we can continue on, repeating the same process as the next one. Slot that into place and hold it once again. So now I've shown you the basics of those first few pieces. I'm going to quickly work my way through the rest of the base plates for the two platform sections and we can move on to adding the sides as well. So as you can see, we've now got all the supporting structure in place on the base plates for each of the platforms now. Now what I did before I started this, I laid all the component parts out either side of the platform so it made it nice and easy to find what I needed next. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to focus my attention onto the shorter of the two platforms. So I'm just going to move some of the parts for the larger one out of the way. So now what we've got is this base section and I've got all the sides which join together to go along the front of it as well. So I'm going to work down the rear face first 
adding in the components there. Now you notice that the rear section pieces, they've got actually got tooth corners on them as well. So when you come to slot them together, they have to slot together in the right way in order to fit together. And then when they do, they'll fit around the back of the platform and go into place nice and neatly. So let's join the outer pieces. We're going to put a little bit of super glue along the leading edge. And also on the end of this main supports. So we'll drop this piece into place. Then hold it whilst it sets. Now being quick setting super glue, this won't take long to set into place. In fact, even now it's already set enough for me to let go of it. So as I said before, these end sections, they've got the teeth that slot in. So they very neatly fit around there. So what we're going to do is add the super glue into the joints. Along the bottom edge. Bring the piece round and slot it into place. Hopefully without fixing my finger to the base plate. repeat that on the other side now as well. So I'm basically I'm pretty much filling each of these joints with super glue and then running a bead along the bottom. And every now and again I stick my fingers to the wood. So we're now able to move along and continue doing the next section of the edge of the platform now. So this one's going to take a little bit more care. So we've got this piece here ready to go in. So again, filling each of the gaps there with super glue. Then running a bead along the platform face and on the, to the end of the supports as well. I'm going to slot that into the teeth at that end. and in between each of the ports all the way along the platform edge. Whilst we're at this end, I'm also going to add the other side onto here as well, which is the wrong piece, now to turn the platform around. So that'll be this piece here. Again, just checking that it all fits as it should do. Do a little dry run, and we can work our way along adding all the glue to this piece. Now one of the uh, advantages or disadvantages, depending on how you look at it, of our laser cut kits is the fit of the joints are very tight. Now it does mean that it's very easy to get them all assembled square. It does mean that from time to time, it's just tricky just to get everything to fit together exactly so. It's just worth a little bit of perseverance to make sure everything gets pressed together properly. Now one of the things I'm going to do on this end of the platform as well, I'm just going to put a few dots of super glue along the inside of the platform edges as well. Just a bit of extra bonding to hold it in place. What we don't want is for these to come apart in a couple of months' time.
So now on the final part of the short of the two platforms, I'm going to start by putting in the, the rear section over here. I'm just going to turn my platform up on its side. Add the glue in the same way. Make sure these teeth interlock correctly in the corner. And set this long side piece into place. One of the other tips I give with building models like this is that on the inside face, once the top deck's on this, no one can see whether you've got glue dots or marks on the inside of it. What you want to do is keep the outside face nice and clean, um, and then where you want to add glue or extra glue to support things and join it together more rigidly, you can do so on the inside face of it as well. Right, so now I've got one more piece to go on this one, and then the base of the short platform is complete. And because this one's a particularly long piece, I decided to actually do the gluing in sections rather than trying to do it all in one. Sometimes you might find that the glue goes off too quickly, particularly if it's a very warm day like it is today. So now that that one's finished, It'll sit somewhere around here on the layout when it's all complete. I can move on and I will side to the larger platform whilst this one's set aside to dry. So the process for building up the larger of the two platforms is exactly the same, it's just everything's a little bit bigger. So I'm going to continue on, get that all done, and then we can add the tops. Right, so that's two platform bases now complete. It's got the inside and the outside track. So this one will go to the inside layout, this one will go to the outside. And they're gonna roughly sit, well, the aim is that this one sits around about there, up against the leading edge of the layout. And this one will sit here with space for three running lines to go through the middle. So there'll be a loop for this platform, a loop in the middle, and then a single line running past this platform here as well. That though was the easy bit. 
I've now got to get all these tops now to fit onto here properly and get them seated in to complete the build of the platforms. So we're now ready to add the top onto each of the platforms. Now these are all designed with the holes to locate on locating pins on top of the um, supports that we've already put in and these supports are designed so that those little pit spigots which come up into here are just slightly shallower than the depth of the platform top material. That means you've got a little bit of filler over the top to finish the model off. And all you're going to do to actually fit this to the platform is line up the first two, then line up the second two, then gradually work your way along the platform to ensure that each pair of locating pins goes into place. That'd be great if we didn't have to fix it down with glue, but it does need fixing with glue as well. Otherwise, as soon as you touch it, the platform top's going to come back off. I've been using Rocket Rapid Super Glue so far because it's quick setting and fast to work with in terms of building up the actual platform base. But I want a little bit more working time when I'm actually fixing this platform surface in. So I'm going to switch over to another Deluxe Materials product this time. This time they're Glue and Glaze, which is a really useful product. And what can do with this, because it dries clear as well, it's a really advantageous glue to use for lots of different projects. And it's a little bit like a, a PVA, but it's ready mixed in the bottom. You just work along going to be the glue right the way along the length of this platform. And across all the supporting beams as well. And come back down the other side as well. Now being a, a glazing type glue as well, it, it dries clear means you won't be able to see it once it's all set. It's also easy to clean off if you need to do as well. Right, now the fun part. I've got to relocate those N2 points. Those locating pins through this piece. Find the next two. So what I find is once you've got the first two in place, the rest fall into place very easily after that as well. And having taken a couple of dry runs at this as well, it's even easier to locate them as well. Platform one is complete. Now time to switch over and do the other one as well. part of the main platform glued in place. So to complete each of these platform sections we need the platform ramps at each end. These are separate components in the kits and separate components for our components for our test build here as well. Using the same glue I'm going to use glue and glaze again. I'm going to bead a bit down each leg of the platform end and across the actual end of the platform topping. And line up the uh, platform ramp and press it into place. Now what I'm also going to do is I'm going to actually use this glue and glaze to fill the joint here as well. It's one of its handy properties. So I've just filled the joint with glue and glaze and then wiped away the excess. I use the same material now to fill all these tiny holes as well. So once the platform is painted, you won't notice them at all then. Right, so we can pop the main platform aside. Right, I'm going to pop it into its actual position. Then we can finish off the other platform.
So it's now time for the finishing touches for these platforms. So we've got all these very thin strips of edging, which go just underneath the edge of the platforms. They very neatly finish and they cover all the joins under here. So they're quite tricky to fit. Once they're in place, as you can see, even though they're, that's loose fitted now, it makes a big difference to the appearance of the platforms. So I'll work my way through these, get them all installed. These platforms will be finished, ready to move on for painting. So the platforms are now complete, they're ready to be set aside to dry and then hopefully overnight tonight I can get them primed so they're then ready for their top coat finishing paint on them. Right, now what we need to talk about is track. Introducing Key Model World, your new online destination for everything railway and scale modelling. Featuring exclusive videos and features, unseen images, step-by-step -step guides, railway history and the latest news. Plus, it's home to our full layout build series. I'm going to stop you right there, though, because okay. I didn't do this. This is all you're doing. Join us for the latest content from Key Publishing's modelling titles, Hornby Magazine and Airfix Model World. Sign up today for as little as £3.75 per month, or if you're a magazine subscriber, bolt Key Model World onto your subscription package now. For more details, visit keymodelworld.com. So we lifted your own devices and here we go, we've got the makings of a station already. Yeah, and a few more things came out of the box as well, which is the penalty for leaving me on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you do like to play. Absolutely. Well, it's all part of the fun, isn't it? This is what it it's is, all about, yeah, is course. building a model railway, seeing how things are going to look and getting a, a sense of where we're going. So we're going to talk track right now because we've got the bare bones of the station, of course, with the platforms in place and some buildings loosely placed on the layout there. Track is what we really need, though, to get this all working so yes we're not going to get very far without it no we? we're not <laughs> no it's all going to grind to a halt so what um is available so you've got two basic choices at the moment for track systems for tt 120 scale so pico has introduced a range of flexible track and uh, live frog electrofrog points uh, and hornby with its train set side of things has also brought out its own set of sectional track and it's got insulated frog points in that as well so both have got a choice of uh, types of points as well uh, so Hornby's got a left and right hand standard point, it's also got a diamond crossing. And then Pico has brought out a uh, medium and a short radius point together with a diamond crossing as well. The ranges are coming together. Um, there are some subtle differences though between Hornby track and Pico track. Yes, that's right. So the, the main difference between the two is actually in the rail profile. So if, if you've been an engage modeler in the past, you're about to recognize the two track codes I'm about to refer to. So Hornby's sectional track uses code 80 rail which is the same as um, sectional track in N-Gage. Um, and the Pico um, track, that uses code 55 rail, which is a finer rail profile, and that's the same as the fine scale N-Gage track as well. So really quite nice fine rail profiles for both of these types of track. So crucially, are they compatible? Well, like the N-Gage code 80 and code 55 rail profiles, they are just compatible. Um, so the, the advantage and the clever part of the code 55 rail profile is actually that part of the rail is buried inside the sleepers. Um, so you've actually got the point where the rail joiners goes on is actually down inside the sleeper web, which means it gives you that nice fine rail profile, but it's still got the strength as well that you need. Um, so when you just join a piece of code 80 track, you'll actually find that the rail profile is pretty much the same height. Um, they don't line up absolutely pin accurate perfect, but they are very close to one another. And I've, I've done it before with code 80 rail and code 55 rail and engage. People remember I engaged like Baronthorpe. Um, I used both types of track on that and it worked very successfully. Um, I must hasten to add at this point, I haven't actually physically tried running trains over these. I have just tried putting the two pieces of track sure. together and it's given the same kind of vision as what I'd expect from those track um, rail profiles in engage. Now, Hornby's points are insulfrog frog points, yeah. but Pico's points are there latest unifrog style aren't yes. they how do, how do they work right so they work by having a switchable frog in the center of the point uh, which is isolated from the rest of the point so one of the difficulties of a point in model railway scenarios is you've got conflict of electricity going through it when you switch the point blades over on a traditional point like this one here it switches the left and right rail at the center so you don't have any problem with that continuity the unifrog takes away that because actually it's independently um fed um, but it, and the advantage there is that if you're using these unifrog points, you haven't got any dead spots through the point. 
Whereas one of the issues sometimes with uh, an insulated frog point, particularly with one with the frog length of the Hornby ones, is that if you've got small locos like the Hornby 08, for example, in TT120 scale, if you're going reasonably fast, it will run straight through the point. But if you're going very slowly, it might find you might find it stalls on the point because its wheelbase is very short and therefore it hasn't got enough wheelbase to span the distance over the insulated frog. Okay, so we've got Hornby's sectional track, we've got Pico's flexible track. Which one are we going for with the layout? Well, I'm going to go with the flexible track system for this layout. So if you're brand new to building model railways, sectional track is brilliant because you can just join it together, create a working layout in minutes, you can pin it down or you can just leave it if it's a, just a very quick temporary layout to test run something, for example, which we have done in the office, mm -hmm. joined it together, made a test track to run TT locos on. Um, sectional track's great for that. Um, but for what I'm looking for from this layout, um, I want long flowing curves around this. It's like with the, the line behind us here, for example, coming across this viaduct mm. and the sweeping curves that are going to come around this side, I'd never be able to build those out sectional track. Okay. Um, so that's why I'm going to turn to the flexible track to give me that real kind of real realistic mainline feel to the finished track work on this layout. When you're using flexible track such as this, what do you have to bear in mind? Right, so you need more tools for a start. Mm -hmm. um, you need to buy separate rail joiners, you need to buy insulated rail joiners as well. Um, there's a little bit more to think about with flexible track. Um, you also need to be, get to be comfortable with bending and shaping the rail as well. Now, it, it sounds quite daunting when you say I'm going to bend the rail, so, but it, it's, it's only got a certain amount of bend and give in it before it, it needs real pressure to do it. But it does mean you can make really fine, smooth curves like that. Um, in an instant, which will give you a much nicer and more realistic looking railway as well. Um, now, there are things that will help you with this as well. So you can buy um, a product from Westall Wagon Works. They do a set of track set of gauges for TT, uh, all set to different radii. So you can use those to help you set straight track as well as curved track as well. So it makes it a bit easier when using these. Or if you're really confident with this stuff, you can just do like I did, bend it to shape, pin it down and run some trains. Okay, so typically with uh, putting the track down, just simply putting the track down on this layout, how long do you think it would take you to set this up with flexible track? Well, we're at the end of the first half day that I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier in this video. Yeah. I'm, I'm aiming that by the end of tomorrow, in the next full day on this layout, that this is a fully working layout, all track laid, with wiring connected so I can run a train around it. Will you be uh, using foam underlay at all or are you planning no, to I'm use actually, this purely as it is? This is going to go straight down the baseboard this time. Mm -hmm. um, I've done this before with N-gauge and narrow gauge layouts as well where I've just gone straight on the baseboard instead. Um, I, I could make time to put in the, the underlay and, and add proper ballast shoulder as well but I don't feel it's going to need it. Um, I might be wrong and you can correct me in the comments if I am wrong, <laughs> by all means. Uh, but at the moment I'm quite comfortable with the idea of this being pinned straight to the baseboards mm -hmm. um, and then being ballasted from there. I'm guessing the proof of the pudding will be in the eating on that score. It certainly will, yes. Either um, way, it will run very nicely. <laughs> okay, and in terms of the points, uh, because you've got the Unifrog style point, will you be keeping them as um, insole frog style or will you be doing them as uh, electro frog style? Well, so I'm going to wire these in as well. So we're going to put all the wiring through for each of these points and then we're going to connect them to the DCC concepts, cobalt point motors, uh, that are going to be used to switch all the points on this as well. Um, they've got a frog switching output on them as well, which makes it really simple to connect that up and power the frog as well. So if you want to see how that's done, keep watching as well to uh, find out more. Yes, indeed. I'll be going through all this in lots of lovely detail. Either that or I'm not going to bore you all to tears. One or the other. <laughs> we'll find out. So. <laughs> well, in that case, it's probably time for me to go and get my tea and uh, come back and see when you've uh, completed the next section. You do know I'm going home today as well, right? <laughs> You're kidding. You're not leaving me You're here. You're kidding. Don't leave me here. <laughs> <laughs> it's got the lock on the door. <laughs> I get out first, I don't know. <laughs> I'll find you a pasty, it'll be fine. Well, there you go. What can I say? Pasty's offered. I'm in for the night, apparently. <laughs> right, it's now time to start laying down the track for this new TT120 layout. Uh, another eager part of this project. I'm looking forward to getting stuck in with my traditional track laying tools here to lay the Pico flexible track. Now, there's a few things you're going to need to hand in order to do track laying process. Uh, first, you're going to need a craft knife and that's to cut away the sleeper webbing underneath the rails when you come to rail joints and baseboard joints as well. Uh, it's worth having a pin hammer as well. Um, brilliant piece of kit for when you're putting track pins in place between the rails. And be very careful when you are using a pin hammer like this because it is very easy to hit it wrong and to damage the rail head as well. Um, I've got a pair of pliers, also useful for pressing track pins into place to tack the rails into the position where you want them. And finally, I've got a cutting disc as well. Now, there are a couple of choices when it comes to cutting rails. One is to use a handsaw, like a hacksaw or a razor saw, or 
as I'm going to do here, I'm going to use the Dremel drill here with a slitting disc in it. Now, one thing to be aware of with the slitting discs is every now and again, they will snag on a piece of metal inside the rail and then they will shatter. So you need to make sure you have some eye protection around when you are using these cutting discs as well. In terms of the track, we're going to be using Pico's new Code 55 flexible track for this layout. Now, this is a great piece of kit to use for a model railway where you want nice, long, flowing curves like we're going to have on this layout. Uh, it comes in yard lengths like this. So you can bend this and shape this to whatever shape you want in order to follow different curve profiles. Uh, as you can see, running through this side of the layout here, we've got a nice snaking shape through the layout here as well. You'll never be able to replicate that with uh, sectional fixed track pieces. So using the flexible track is really important. Now, this is also a portable layout as well. So that does mean we're gonna have baseboard joints to contend with as well. So I've got a pair of, well, actually I've got many pairs of, uh, the Modeltech rail joiners as well, which are useful for the baseboard connections. Now what you do with these is you fix them down either side of the baseboard joints and then when you take the baseboards apart they always ensure your track comes back into position correctly because what we do is we solder the base of the rails onto the model tech rail aligners and then everything's firmly fixed in place at every single baseboard joint. Now a couple of those I might have to do a little bit of modification for because I've got some curved baseboard joints as well where the lines are going to swing around this curve for example so you won't be able to use them exactly as designed but it'll be very close to how they're designed. Right. Another important point I think to mention is actually when it comes to laying this track across the baseboard joint, you'd be tempted potentially to just take two pieces of track either side of the baseboard joint and try and line them up across the joint. But actually the chances are if you do that, you end up with a step or some kind of problem with the rails where I find actually when it comes to doing baseboard joint track laying, you're better off laying the track completely across it, cutting away the webbing, fitting the rail liners underneath and then actually cutting the track after you've set it all into place. That means that once it's all set into place, it's not going to move again and it will stay in the same place when you come back to rejoin the layout later in life as well. Right, explanation out of the way. I think it's about time I got on with actually putting some physical track down. So one of the important details with laying flexible track is you need to fit rail joiners to the end of every section of railway you want to join it together. So these are small metal rail joiners that Pico supplies and they simply slide onto the end of the rail. Can be a little bit tricky and fiddly. But once they're in place, they'll serve their purpose and do their job. Occasionally you might find you just want to get a little bit of assistance from a pair of pliers just to slide them on because they, uh, they can be a little bit sharp on the end of your fingers. So with our rail joiners in place, I can then bring in another yard length of track, slide that into the other side of the rail joiners until it's fully flush. And now our two sections of track are joined together. Now I'm just going to adjust the position of one of the rail joiners so that the, two, the rail joint sits central in it. And then we're all ready. The next step then with this section of track is going to be about adding the Model Tech rail alignment pieces in underneath. So to do that they're going to sit just there which means I'm going to need to remove six sleepers from underneath the rails. And to do that I'm just going to use my craft knife, cut the webbing underneath, and then we can pull those six sleepers away from the rails. What we'll do is we'll end up with those rail, rail alignment pieces slotted underneath. Just going to take out a little bit more of the sleeper web in there as well. They just fit perfectly inside there now. So 
So I started now to pin down the uh, Model Tech rail alignment piece here. So it's got three pin holes in each one. Just using a pair of pliers here just to push the pins straight through into the baseboard. The advantage of using plywood is the, uh, the pins go quite easily into the board. Push them all the way around. Once we've got all the track into place, we'll actually solder those rails onto the alignment piece there. Uh, before we do that though, I'm going to continue and actually tack this track down either side as well. Just introducing a slight curve as it comes off the rail alignment joiner there. To make sure this next section is nice and straight off the back of there as well. Now we can start shaping this section of track here. So when I'm laying curved flexible track, you've got to be conscious that as you shape the rail, it will pull one rail tighter than the other. So what I try and do is feed it into the curve So it doesn't pull too much on the rail where we've got it joined up here as well. And you're looking for nice smooth transitions between straight and curved track as well. That's the whole point of using the flexible track. And you can see we've already got quite a nice looking piece of track through there. Just going to put one more pin in just to tack it in place. I've only just put that part way down, so I might need to adjust it in a moment. That's got that piece heading in the right direction. Now, at uh, this end of the track, so you can now see at this end of the track, that actually we've got the two rails now at different lengths. So that's not really very helpful for when we want to join the next piece of track onto it. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to use the mini drill with a cutting disc in it, which will show you the way around, it's easy to see. And we're going to actually cut through the rail on this side to make it match the length of the outer rail as well. That gives a nice neat joint then which can join the next piece of track onto to continue the track going round to the side of the layout. Another important step here, we're going to need to take away one of the sleepers as well to give ourselves space to put the next rail joiner in as well. As you can see, now the two rail joins onto the end of the track here as well, onto the next piece we're going to join together. So I'm just going to line those up with the first piece. Make sure that both of them go into position correctly. And whilst we're here, I'm going to tack this end of the uh, first piece down as well. Make sure I'm happy with all its alignment. Then we can start working this next piece of track into place. One of the challenging parts of laying curves is getting the joint smooth and the flow of the next section smooth as well. So we'll tack this side in place. We're actually going to pop this pin out.
as you can see, I'm making a fair bit of progress now with the track laying around the layout. I've been following the same techniques which we showed in the first few clips where we're laying down the line, tacking it in place with track pins, putting those rail joins on to join the flexible track together and make sure we set the model tech rail alignment joiners at each baseboard join as well. So I started round at this join here, we've got the nice flowing curve through that section. It's leaning back across into the station here. We can now see we've got the first points going into place as well. So these are the Pico Unifrog points, which means that actually you can use them straight out of the box without any wiring, or you can use this separate wire that's on them. You can unwind that, set that through the baseboard and connect that to a frog switch underneath your layout. Now you can use that either with analog or digital control. Now if you're gonna use digital control like we are, we're gonna use the DCC Concept Cobalt point motors and they've got a frog switch built into their circuit board as well. Now using that frog switch on the DCC Concepts Cobalt makes this really easy to wire up. So all you have to do is feed the track power into the point motor, where you would as if you're gonna connect it to the DCC bus, and then you take the connection for the frog wire from that to this piece of wire here, and then join it together, and you've got a frog switch. Now to make that switch connection work, you're gonna to need to make a small hole through the baseboard. So I made a 1.5 millimeter hole through the baseboard in order to take that wire. And then because we want to have point motors on this layout as well, um, the tie bars of each of these points, they have little holes either side of the main tie bar. And using those, you can make a pencil mark through them. And then I've drilled out two three and a half millimeter holes and then joined them together. Uh, so you actually get a, a slot there where you can actually put a point motor rod through later on in the process. In the meantime, with those frog wires dropped through the baseboard like they are with these two points, these are already capable of being operated right now. So we could, for example, connect a controller to the track and run a train from where the A4 is now round to roughly where the Mark 1 coach is behind me. Um, I'm not quite at that stage yet. I want to finish off the full circuit to be able to run a train all the way around the layout fairly soon. Now the most complicated part of the track work is obviously going to be through the station here as well. Um, at the moment I'm focused on that outer circuit uh, but once I've got that all set we'll start working on the inner circuit as well which will then lead to installation of all these good yards points here which is going to be the really complicated technical part of the layout to fit together. So we've now reached the point where we're going to add another two points into the track plan uh, and this is where we need to add the holes underneath to allow the point motor to be fitted later and for these frog wires to be dropped through the baseboard as well. So what we're going to do to start with is I'm going to just lift these wires up I'm going to mark their position the side of each of these points and then where we're going to be able to put the point motor holes I'm just going to use the pencil again press it through the hole at the end of the tie bar and the same on the other point as well you'll notice as well that I'm switching the tie bar over to both sides as well that gives me the maximum movement either way for the point actuating rod once the point motor is fitted underneath Right, now I'm going to take both those points away completely. And where I made those two pin marks for the pencil, I'm going to put a line through the centre of them and then down the length of them as well. So I've got a small cross now marked on the baseboard. And the same with these wire markings as well. I'm just going to take them a little bit further in. So that when we make the hole, it'll be just in board over the edge of the sleeper on them as well. So actually that position where the wire goes through will be completely invisible once these are in position. I'm going to start by making the holes for the wires to go through first. And to do that, I've got a 1.5 millimeter drill in my drill here. I'll simply position it on the wood and make a hole right through the board. So with those two holes made, I've now changed over to a three and a half mil drill uh, from DCC Concepts. And I'm going to use that to make a hole through now for the point actuating rod. Now, it's no good making a circular hole in the center of that mark. So I'm going to start with my drill at one side of it and then move it to the other side and then angle the drill to come through and join those two holes together. By doing that, I've got a slot now in the baseboard rather than a singular hole, which means I've got space for the actuating rod, which will move from side to side like that underneath the baseboard to change the direction of the point. So repeat the whole process for the other point, so we can put these points back in place and start laying the track. Now 
and of course this is a smaller gauge as well. It's just worth using a, a file or a sanding stick like this from Albion Hobbies to actually just take away any rough edges around these holes as well. So now, I can bend these wires back the other way underneath the points. Position those in the holes that we made earlier. Slide them into position. Line up the rails at this end. Make sure they're sitting nice and flush. And then I need to check that the position I've got the points at is gonna give me the full space for the actuating rod underneath, which it does. So to actually hold these two points into place, it's gonna need the next section of track to be joined on here as well. So I'm gonna prepare that now, join it on the end, put a pair of track pins in here, and then I've got a third point to go into this junction here, uh, which is gonna make the missing piece to allow connection to the inner circuit as well. So this pair of points here will actually be a crossover between the inner and the outer circuits, whereas this point here will be the one that allows trains to either take the loop through the platform or go into the goods loop in the center of the station. So there we go. We've got the outer circuit all in place, all the way around. I can literally, I can run a coach all the way around the layout. Uh, but the most important thing that needs to be done now is we need some wires to this so we can actually test it as well. And um, one of the great beauties of building a model railway is you reach this point where you've got a circuit and you could wire it up and start running some trains. So we're going to get a little test. Not too much though, because I've got to keep focused on actually getting all the rest of this track laid. And I want to see a train go around and then we can move on with adding some more track. So in this part, I'm going to move on and add the first track connection to the layer. Now, this is technically it's a temporary connection because it's just going to allow me to run a train around this circuit, make sure everything's going to work as I expected it to, but I'm still going to do it properly in the first place. So the fuel tools and a few pieces of equipment are going to need to do this. So if this was your first train set and you didn't want to go down this route, you can buy track connecting clips. You can also buy rail joints, which are pre-soldered with wires on them as well. So there's lots of options to make it easier for you to do this. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to use this drill with a 1.5 mil drill bin in it. I'm going to put two holes either side of the rails here, which allow the wires to slip through underneath the baseboard and be completely out of sight. I'm going to use two colours of seven strand 0.2 millimetre wire, which is here, so a black and a red colour. Now the reason for using the multi-core wire is that it allows the wire to be more flexible without any chances of breakages. If you've got a single core wire, like we actually have on the, the points, then the more times you move that, the more chance there is of weakening that and allow it to break as well. Finally, we're going to need a pair of wire strippers, which we use to bare the ends of the wires so we can get bare wire to solder the rail sides. Really important to use wire strippers, don't use your teeth or pairs of scissors or anything like that because you're going to damage the wires as well. Uh, and then finally over here we've got the most important ingredients which are a 25 watt Antec soldering iron and we've got suitable solder as well to actually join those wires to the rail sides. Now fairly simple collection of tools here but if you haven't got them already then it's a little bit of a shopping trip for you I'm afraid uh, but they are really useful things and if you're going to go down this route of wiring you'll see around this layout there can be a lot of wiring connections on it where we're putting droppers in to connect everything back to the main power source on the layout. So the first step is then to make the two holes either side of the rails. So I'm going to use my drill, make a hole here. So then we're going to choose red wire for the inner rail and we'll use black wire for the outer rail. And we repeat that all the way around the whole layout so everything's wired up the same. So use a pair of DCC Concepts wire strippers. They're fully adjustable for different wire gauges. I've set them up for this type of wire we're using here. I'm going to strip off about 15 millimetres of insulation. Then once I've done that, twist those multi-core wires together. Then I put a little kink five millimetres from the end of the wire, which is what I'll use to actually solder to the side of the rail. And now the next important process is we're going to use solder and soldering iron to tin both the wire and the rail. And when we refer to tinning, that's where you actually add solder to the wire and to the rail side first before you join them together. That makes it much easier to actually bond those two pieces together with the soldering iron when it comes to making the final connection. It means you only need two hands at a time as well. So being smaller track as well, you have to be very careful when you make your solder connection on the side of the rail so you don't melt sleepers.
trying to be as neat as possible with the soldering connection just to give you the minimal amount of cleanup required at the end of the process. Right, now I've got to repeat the same with the black wire for the outer rail. Then we can drop them through the baseboard and temporarily connect them to a controller. Right, so I know that when these two wires pass through the baseboard, when I ultimately connect them to the actual main power feed that's going to run around underneath the layout, the actual chocolate block that connects them is probably going to be about here. So I don't know particularly long wires, but just temporarily because I want to join them to a separate control box for the time being. I'm going to make the wires much longer than I need them to be. And raw some extra wire. Cut them off. I'm going to feed each of these through the holes in the baseboard. Then I'll pull them through from underneath. So if you've got good, strong solder connection, those wires will stay perfectly well attached, even with that much pressure being put on to pull the wires through underneath. So that's power connection number one done. Now I need to move on, connect that to a controller, and soon have this A4 running around our TT layout. So here we are again. It seems that leaving you to your own devices works, doesn't it? Apparently so, yeah. <laughs> so everyone's welcome to join in if they want to help. You know, it's a, a bit more track to lay yet to finish it off, but the train is moving. We've going got around. trains. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, One there. Is, yeah. One there. Yeah. Important Fantastic. testing now we're doing. Yes, of course. Yes. 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 I'll yes. just set the speed up a little bit faster. There we go. Yeah. So there we go. So yes, layout now works. It is yep. a very rudimentary connection. It's literally two wires have been tacked in there. Yep. Um, that's giving power through the whole layout currently in, its, in the way it is at the moment. Got a lot more wiring to add in because this is a portable layout, which means I've got to have uh, baseball brakes everywhere as well. Uh, but these clever Pico Unifog points, I um, mean, I can actually already switch tracks and everything will run through now into that middle line as well. Yep. Um, so they're really quite a nice design. The, the, the actual center frog part of the point is completely unpowered as they are at the moment. Uh, but the, the wire, like I've explained already, is, is you take that wire down, take it through the baseboard, then you can power the frog independently of the rest of the point, uh, which means they, at the moment they kind of act like an insulated frog point, uh, but we can then change them into a full live frog point as well, which is particularly good for DCC, which is how we'll be controlling this layout as well. So we're already getting an idea of what the track layout's now going to appear like. Yes. So we've got yeah. the, the main line through on one circuit, yeah. together with the loop into the platform, yeah. and the bare bones of the the other circuit yeah. just about to start. That's right, yeah, so I haven't actually pinned any of this inner circuit down yet, mm. but the, the inner circuit is a little bit simpler. Um, so it's got the option where you could reverse the train into the centre loop if you wanted mm -hmm. to. But the, the main train storage for the inner circuit is going to be a, a long siding running right across this way. Um, so that gives a nice long space to store a train as well. Um, so we have to have two trains for each circuit. A few of the wagons floating around in the goods yard, an extra head shunt for the goods yard as well. So there's going to be plenty of play value in this as well. Um, and then obviously the engine shed, which we're working towards putting in over there at the moment. And then the piece of the resistance will be behind me here. Yes. 
So what have you got planned there? Remind us. Right, so we've got a long embankment coming across here, nice curving flowing track arrangement, and then here will be a viaduct. And I can't wait to build it. <laughs> and this is going to be a multi-span viaduct. That's right, yeah. So um, yeah, we'll find out how many, but it's going to be several. So several spans. It should look pretty good when it's all done. Fantastic. Now, in terms of the um, setting up of the, the track work here, you've already put holes in the baseboard ready for the point motors to go in as well. Yep. And um, have you wired it yet or is that No, it's come? literally, at the moment, we're off just two wires tacked in over in the corner there. They were on need a power feed later anyway to link mm -hmm. between the two baseboards. Uh, but it's literally those two wires are feeding the entire outer circuit at the moment, uh, providing all the power. Now, like I say, once it's a portable layout, all the tracks we've got be cut at the baseboard joints, which means they'll need power feeds to all sections of the layout as well. Uh, so a lot more wires to add to this yet. Well, at least we know what you're going to be up to for the rest of the evening. Well, there is that, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm now at the end of, well, it became day, um, well, we had half a day yesterday, ended with less than half a day today. So I've been in here for about, well, about two and a half hours, has laid all the outer circuit yeah. of the track, uh, including the loop there as well. All the point motor holes are in for those four points that are connected into this main line as well. Um, so reasonable progress. It's, it's just, looking great. You know, I could do with another four hours now and then I'll have all the other track down. <laughs> well, I mean, the good thing is it's coming together. We've got, like, as you promised, there would be trains running. There are trains running. And there are trains running. We've had both <laughs> locomotives running around the, uh, the layout to test indeed. it, which yeah. is great. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's coming together nicely. It is indeed. So um, we're going to take over on track lane. Well, I was just going to let you, as you've made such good progress, I was going to let you carry on and just spend the rest of the hour. If you want another three or four hours, feel free. You're going home for dinner though, aren't you? Maybe. Maybe. You leave me here <laughs> in the three hours again. <laughs> Radio. Definitely more track to lay. I want to get all this finished as soon as possible now because um, time's ticking on this deadline for the Great Electric Train Show. So Mike, here we are with the layout to its latest finished standard. Well, finish is a bit of a stretch of the uh, imagination now, I think, with this. But <laughs> yeah, yes, just a little. Yes, but at least more, we've got track. It is more complete than it was a few hours ago. It so, was indeed. Yeah, you've done a, yeah. done a grand job, actually. Yeah, so we've got all the track is now laid, uh, apart from the loco shedder, mm -hmm. which I'm still just, I'm just tinkering my points there. I'm not entirely happy with what I've got yet. Okay. Uh, but I'm not a million miles away from being able to make my decisions on that as well. Yeah. Uh, last bit of track to do over there. I'm also going to try and put a bay platform in at the front of the platform mm -hmm. as well, which I think might look quite nice as well. Um, whether we actually use it is another question, but everything will be wired, everything does work. Locos can run through all these points and everything, uh, all the way up into the yard here as well. I see um, you've been is, yeah. very busy, which yeah. is great. You've got uh, joiners between the baseboards yes. as well. Yep, they're all now soldered in as well. Uh, had a help from our, well, Phil, who designs our laser cut kits. He came and we spent an afternoon getting all the wiring in, getting all the soldering done, and then we got through that job a lot quicker than if I'd just done it all on my own as well. So. And what have you used to do that? But right, so they're, uh, they're Model Tech rail aligners. Um, which are um, well, nice little copper clad sleepers basically, but they're all preset with holes in them for track pins to go through. Uh, and they've also then they've got a position where the rails can sit over the top. So you solder the rails onto those alignment pieces. That means the track's always set in the same position, so it won't deviate from its position. And because of the design of the face where they actually join together the, the aligners, it also helps when you're realigning your baseboard as well. Right. Um, so they're, they're a really nice piece of kit and um, takes a bit of time to put them all in, sold them all into place, but they do do an important job, particularly on a portable layout like this. There is one job left to do with them though. I've still got to cut all the track. I was just going to say, <laughs> so then you just have to cut the track, yes, cut through yes, the rails. So you, yeah. you lay them underneath the track before you cut the rails, and then when I'm ready to dismantle all this, I'll go around and I'll cut all the rails to, to make sure it's all functioning correctly. So note to self, remember to cut those through before dismounting the yes. baseboards. Yes, which reminds me of one of the first days you came to work and we were with layouts and we were working on 12 Trees Junction. I remember the horror on your face. I picked up the mini drill and went all the way across. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that, that was, my face was a picture. Yeah, that particular a picture day. indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we digress. Okay, so um, you've got 
the track down, you've got the baseball connectors in place, and I believe you also fully wired it. It is all fully wired now underneath as well, yes. So um, everything is there that ne is needed to power the layout. Um, it's quite a simple um, setup, I suppose, in a way. Um, it's, it's got what we call a power bus running around all the way underneath the layout, which is basically it's a pair of twin core wires, um, which run, well, actually the power picks up here, and then from there, you've got a cable, a main cable, if you like, not a mains cable, because you don't put any mains power to your layout, but a main cable for the electrical system on this layout, which runs from there round to that board. So because that's then the end of one end of it, it's then there's no join between the boards behind me. Then it does the same in the opposite direction. So there's a main cable running through each baseboard uh, all the way around to the other side here. And then off there, there's droppers running off each one of those, which go to all the track fat power feed sections on the layout. So it's little things like, for example, this section of track right in front of you mm -hmm. has its own independent power feed in there from the rail joint back because when I cut those two rails, it needs its own power of feed. Of course, yes. Yeah. Um, so all nice and simple, everything's black and red, everything's black lines up with a black wire, everything's red lines lines up with a red wire. Um, again, it's 1.5 millimeter holes everywhere you need a power feed yeah. um, and then connect it all together underneath black to black, red to red. Um, there is now one final piece of electrical wiring to power all the track fully, which is to wire up the frog switches on these as well. So these are the, they're the Pico Uni frogs, which we've already talked about earlier yes. in the video. Uh, and once I've got the point motors in place, they'll take their feed from the track power supply. And then there's a frog switching wire on each one of those point motors where you just add a wire from the little wire which you put through the baseboard, which you, each one of these, connect that to the output on the PCB, on the DCC Concepts Cobalt point motors we use, and then it all works magically and we have fully live points all the way through the layout. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Just like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the thing I'd say about wiring is, is it probably, it, 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 it gets complicated when the more complicated your track is, obviously, yes. because yeah. but you put more and more wires in. But the beauty with DCC is, you're always putting the same two wires in. So the mythical, it's two wires and it works, isn't strictly accurate, but it is the same two wires same over and over again. Same two yeah. wires, just cut, yeah. repeat, cut, yeah, repeat. Exactly, and you haven't got to put all the section, section switches in and things like that mm -hmm. either. Uh, so it does save a lot of time and, and, and understanding with wiring as well. Um, but then it's things like, you know, the Unifrog points are brilliant because then you've got really simple live frog points or in their current format as they are at the moment, they work as an insulated frog mm -hmm. point. So I haven't got to do any complicated wiring just to get the trains running. Um, you know, I can wait until the point motors come in before that gets wired in and it means it's, it still works as it is now. Well, I noticed with the points, it's a very discreet little hole next to the um, yes. tie bar. Yeah, that's right. So uh, to make those holes like you see in the video as well, it's, it's put in two holes next to each other, put the drill through each of those and then lean the drill gently and it cuts the hole together to make the opening. So Mike, what's next? What's next? Well, um, we're pretty much at the end of part one of the TT120 layout build. So we've got all the track laid, we've got trains running, we've got the basics of the buildings in place as well. Uh, part two will be coming next Friday exclusively on Key Model World for freemium member account holders. And you can sign up for free to get one of those. You can watch part two for free exclusively on keymodelworld.com. And then parts three and four, like our previous video series, they'll require our premium subscription, which starts from £3.99 a month for that service. That gives you access to all the parts of this video series and all our previous video series as well and the huge archive of back issues of Hornby Magazine and Airfix Model World back to 2015, best part of 6,000 modeling articles, exclusive video content, the list goes on. It's a bargain, really, what do you think about Absolutely, it? Absolutely, really it's, is. Uh, and excitingly, we've got some brand new kits coming as well. Oh, yeah. So one of them you might have noticed behind Mark here. Yeah, sorry, I was blocking the, blocking the view there for a second. So this is our brand new laser cut viaduct kit. Uh, it's based on one at Radcliffe. Uh, it's been designed for both TT120 and 00 scales as well. So you can take your choice. If you're not a TT model, you can buy one of these for 00 gauge. Uh, they'll be available as a, a twin pack where you get the two end pieces. Or you can buy individual spans to go in between it as well to extend your viaduct to as many spans as you like. Um, they're going to be in stock from the beginning of October on the Key Model World shop. And they'll be followed across November, December and January by another trio of exclusive laser cut kits from the TT120 layout build series. So there will also be the platforms that are here, they'll be available as a kit, but only in TT scale initially. Then we'll also have a kit for tunnel mails, and that will be available in both 00 and TT 120 scales. And if that wasn't enough, we've also got a signal box kit coming for a Great Northern signal box, which will be available in 00 and TT 120 scales as well. So those other three kits, they'll be available to pre-order on the Key Model World Shop from the Great Electric Train Show weekend. And uh, well, we hope you like what we've built so far. 
Absolutely, I mean, that's looking spectacular. It is, I've got a bit of paintwork to finish that. Yes, I mean, you've got just, a bit to just keep you going bit, yeah. this evening. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, this evening, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow evening and the evening after. <laughs> yeah, it's looking good, <laughs> looking very yeah, nice. Indeed, and we do have even more exciting product news as well. So we are now officially a Hornby TT120 stockist. We've got a dedicated page on the key publishing shop to launch our TT120 collection, where you can buy all of Hornby's locomotives and coaches and wagons for TT120, so as Hornby Track, its buildings and accessories, they're all available to buy on the Key Publishing Shop in a dedicated section. True to say, it's all going on. It certainly is, yeah. So, and it's, it's been a really exciting adventure already into TT scale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been nice to cut my teeth on something different. I've been enjoying the size and the feel of all this as well. We hope you enjoyed what we've put together so far in part one. Do join us next week for part two. As I say, that is exclusive to Key Model World, but free to view as a freemium member on keymodelworld.com. And uh, well, Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. See you next week.